and thank you for the invitation um, to speak here. I'm really happy about um, this opportunity. And uh, yeah, my paper today um, is titled uh, Polyamory, Women's Erotic Autonomy and the History of Feminist Critiques of uh, Monogamy. Um, and what I want to do in this paper is um, I would like to uh, place polyfeminist uh, voices um, on women's erotic autonomy or women's erotic self-determination um, within a longer history um, of feminist critiques of uh, monogamy. And I think it's a worthwhile enterprise to do that because um, um, autonomy um, is a fairly precarious concept within feminism. Um, it uh, has not necessarily a good uh, name um, in some strands of uh, feminist discourse. So what I try to do is um, I would like uh, to highlight uh, the prominence of um, feminist voices within polyamory, my first um, contribution, and um, I would like to help to restore um, a focus on autonomy uh, and self-determination uh, within feminism itself, uh, because I don't necessarily think um, it is uh, necessary and the right thing to dismiss autonomy as a political and ethical value um, because it is you know, um, closely bound up um, with notions of resistance and political um, agency. Um, so I would like to direct attention to historical examples of a relational interpretation of autonomy um, within feminism. At the same time, uh, I'm convinced that um, sort of this memory, this archive of uh, feminist analysis of um, female erotic um, autonomy um, can also be a rich resource um, for contemporary poly activists. Um, okay, and um, you know, taking um, due to constrictions of time, my presentations can only be kind of quite sketchy, and I will um, draw on examples primarily from North America, uh, the United Kingdom, or um, Central Europe. Um, you know, some, um, some feminists um, have been um, wary of the uh, concept of um, autonomy and have um, criticized, criticized it um, because um, for them um, autonomy endorses a masculinist um, culture of subjectivity. It um, welcomes uh, masculinist behaviors and endorses uh, masculinist um, character traits. Um, other feminists have argued that um, focusing on individual autonomy uh, misses um, to understand that individuals are always placed within a wider economic context and um, that it is not helpful to think about structural power relations. Um, so, for many critiques of the concept of uh, um, femin um, critiques of the concept of autonomy, um, autonomy is an inherently uh, liberal idea um, which um, encourages us to think uh, about relationality um, from within the paradigm of choice. Um, and which ultimately ignores um, power relations. Um, however, um, what I'd like to do in this paper is to direct attention to a, a rich and expansive history of um, theorizing um, autonomy um, in different ways within feminism. Um, and among others, I draw here um, on an insightful um, overview article by uh, Mackenzie and Stolia, who are, um, who, you know, sort of try to uncover um, the histories of thinking um, autonomy in a relational way, um, in an intersubject relational way, um, and also in an intersectional way, um, yeah, within diverse feminist projects. Um, I also wanted to, you know, to say a few words about um, polyamory. Um, because 
as I said, my attempt is to place polyamory within this larger history. Um, in, it is, or well, it has been argued by uh, many polyamory researchers um, that um, feminists um, are, or that, you know, within poly cultures, within poly communities, you have um, a large numbers of uh, women who identify as feminists, so feminist voices um, are, are, are right there, and uh, feminists are um, yeah, leading in community work and political organizing. Um, I, I suppose most of you are you know, familiar with the concept of polyamory, so I don't say very much about it, but a short way of you know, defining it is probably important. Um, Chef and Hammers, for example, uh, define polyamory as a form of association in which people openly maintain uh, multiple romantic, sexual, and or affective relationships. Um, many writers and activists around polyamory have described it as an umbrella term for, in quotation marks, responsible forms of non-monogamy, um, which you know usually means um, consensual forms of uh, non-monogamy. And um, yeah, Alesha has already sort of pointed to some of the downsides of um, defining polyamory. Um, that way, but I think it is a very common and widely shared discourse. Um, Elizabeth Emmons would argue that polyamory, um, even if it is a contested term, and people you know, inter interpret it in different ways, um, usually evolves around certain core values, uh, and she names um, self-knowledge, radical honesty, honesty um, consent, self-possession, and uh, tendency to privilege um, love and sexuality over other things such as um, jealousy um, which may occur in relationships. Um, and I would argue that some of these you know, core values, um, if we accept that description and analysis, uh, have a close bearing on uh, questions of erotic self-determination or um, erotic autonomy. Um, okay. In the following, you know, I want to give a kind of a, maybe a sketchy overview, looking at some of examples of, um, you know, um, feminist um, theories um, on um, erotic autonomy. So, you know, basically what I would want to argue is that there have been, you know, very, very different forms of critiquing uh, monogamy within you know different um, periods of feminism and different local feminist struggles um, um, and even if we you know recognize these, this difference I assume that uh, many of these critiques converge in that they um, cluster and are built around a concern with um, women's erotic um, self-determination and you can identify a value of um, you know, women's erotic um, agency or um, autonomy in Marxist and anarchist feminisms, in existentialist feminism, in um, the radical feminism of the 1970s and 80s, but also in um, the more like identity political um, strands of these feminisms, um, such as lesbian feminism, bisexual feminism, or queer or heterosexual feminist critiques of um, patriarchy. So I will, you know, uh, focus on sing singular examples. Maybe the most obvious one, and unfortunately, I cannot go into much um, detail. Um, I, you know, I wanted to say a few words on, um, you know, two um, inspirational. Um, um, the feminists um, who, whose, whose work has uh, strongly been concerned uh, with women's um, erotic autonomy. Um, Alexandra um, Kollontai, um, a Russian revolutionary um, who was also um, yeah, an author, a poet, <laughs> a, a writer, um, sort of um, 
you know, wrote some, some novels um, which are um, concerned um, with yeah, women's experiences um, in relationship um, to men. Um, Alexandra Kollontai is very often cited as if she, you know, would be an advocate of um, the, I think it's called the water glass theory, like, you know, having sex is okay, it's just, you know, um, fulfilling a, a natural urge, we shouldn't make such a fuss about it. Um, and Alexandra Kollontai is often read to be an advocate of free love. She herself contested that view. And she said, like, you know, that what her work was about was not necessarily an advocation of, of, of free love or of multiple partnership, um, but um, her major point was uh, that she wanted to encourage women um, to refuse being enslaved by men, either in marriage or in other conjugal relationships. So, um, Colin Ties, um kind of notion of autonomy um, could be seen um, to be a kind of negative um, freedom, the freedom um, from control um, by man. And um, for her, this freedom was very important in particular uh, for women to, yeah, in a way, go their own way and to f be free to unfold their capacities for political activism or for, you know, other forms of creative um, work. Um, Emma Goldman, um, a Russian Jewish um, a revolutionary and anarchist, um, who shaped the history of the anarchist movement, international anarchist movement, and who was very active in the United States in later parts of her life, um, is a much more unequivocal um, advocate of free love, and, and her work is um, outstanding. Um, for you know, feminist work in that time, because um, yeah, she she actively advocated women's rights to be engage to engage in multiple relationships. Uh, she spoke in favor and in defense of sex workers, and in in general, she developed her critique in, as part of a larger political framework um, in which um, her notion of autonomy. Um, kind of um, emphasized a freedom of influence from the state or entered the church and also individual um, men. Um, some uh, writers like for example Claire Hemmings who has recently turned towards uh, the biographical study um, of um, Emma Goldman argue that if you read her work carefully you also find um, you know, maybe a kind of romantic um, endorsement of sexuality, potentially promiscuous sexuality, as a, a vital force, um, as a kind of life-affirming uh, force um, within human beings in general, but also within women. Um, Simone de Beauvoir's um, work... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I knew it would happen. <laughs> Shouldn't move so much. <laughs> um, Simone de Beauvoir's um, um, work has been very, very influential in uh, European feminist uh, movements um, in the second part of the 20th um, century. Um, um, her, um, her work um, critiqued, her philosophy critiqued um, women's um, subordination and women's othering in, in a gender order um, which in a way um, ascribes proper subjectivity and full human status um, only um, to men. Women are framed as others, women are denied subjectivity and as such also denied um, recognition as a creative um, yeah, create, creative um, people, creators of philosophy, creators of artwork, or meaningful um, rational philosophy and um, discourse. Um, so her emphasis on um, erotic autonomy um, kind of is articulated as a critique of marriage or a critique of constraining um, um, conjugal relationship um, with domineering man. So she rejects the treacherous security which women may find 
um, also the economic security women may find um, in long-term bonds um, with um, men and um, yeah, if um, you read her work you also find you know um, sections in which she actively um, or proactively defends um, women's engagement in casual sexual affairs. Um, a major emphasis may be in a similar way, similar to Colin Tai, is um, you know the use women may make of that freedom in order to create um, their life, their life work. Um, yeah, as single women or as women who uh, look for casual gratification or as women who may be in mul multiple. Uh, long-term partnership relations, which was also something um, she has um, done in the course of her life. Um, I would like to move on to say a few words on um, anti-non-monogamy critiques and the so-called um, second wave feminism, uh, feminisms in, in um, Europe. Um, you have a very strong focus on uh, both personal and institutional um, factors um, and yeah you know um, the discourse of autonomy is um, mm, strongly focuses on a critique of um, also the realm of production and um, reproduction um, the critique of non-monogamy is somewhat more muted in feminist debates nowadays um, as um, some more, let's say, um, polyamorous, um, pro non monogamy or sex radical feminists would complain. Um, but it, uh, it lives on in um, kinky, queer, anarcho feminist, and other uh, sex radical or sex positive um, forms of politics. And um, what I originally wanted to do is, is I wanted to sort of, in a way, attempt a comparison um, between, you know, let's say, um, between erotic or, you know, discourses on erotic autonomy in various identity political strands of feminism. So I find it quite interesting to ask to what extent is the discourse on erotic autonomy in lesbian feminist different from the discourse on erotic autonomy in bisexual feminisms. Um, and how do hetero -feminist, heterosexual feminist voices fit into that um, picture? Um, and I unfortunately do not have um, enough time to do that, so I will have to, you know, to, to go on rather quickly. Um, my argument would be, you know, that actually lesbian feminists have led the debate of uh, or the critique of um, monogamy in that period and uh, lesbian feminist um, critique of monogamy was part of a larger enterprise of um, opposing um, hetero patriarchy and um, you you know could argue a critique of uh, monogamy um, which is only because what Daniel Putin pointed out in a personal conversation, is implicit in um, Adrian Rich's work of um, um, critique of compulsive um, heterosexuality. I would argue um, a, a, a potential endorsement of, um, of um, non-monogamy could all be, also be found in Audre Lorde's um, uh, insightful um, theorization of the erotic as a uh, yeah a life a vital life force and a community bond um, among women. Um, lesbian feminists have also been very very active in the various let's say in articulating various sex radical positions in the sex wars in the 1980s and 90s. A very interesting period of feminist politics, which I unfortunately don't have time to explore in detail. Um, bisexual feminists, just, uh, just a, a few words, it's quite interesting that in the 1980s and 90s bisexual feminists um, made uh, 
asserted their solidarity uh, with lesbian feminists and their critique in many regards um, paralleled the critique of lesbian feminists, the critique of heteropatriarchy, um, but um, there are also dis distinctive uh, differences to the extent that you know some bisexual women would um, sort of um, present an argument that um, yeah there's a, the, uh, the autonomy to choose you know the love of both the love with men, the love with women in the 1980s, you know, bisexuality still was articulated within a rather um, gender binary framework. Um, or, yeah, nowadays we would uh, be more attuned to say the love of people of um, whatever gender. Um, heterosexual feminists, all I wanted to say in that particular period, um, the critique of um, um, heterosexual women of monogamy was very precarious. Two minutes, okay. Yeah, no, I know. I, I sum up. Um, okay. Um, I hope I have shown with my uh, sketchy um, examples um, that um, concepts of erotic autonomy um, have been core to feminist critiques of patriarchy, heteropatriarchy, and sex, uh, sexuality since the 19th um, century. Um, most of these critiques um, mm, focus on structural power relations and are um, relational in that um, sense. So, um, Feminist critiques of uh, monogamy have um, looked at institutions such as patriarchy, marriage, reproduction, and socialist feminism also the way how um, the relations of um, productions are organized. Um, and this applies um, yeah, to virtually all the feminist um, branches or theories I have um, covered. Um, my argument is that um, polyfeminists um, could draw upon this legacy, um, in particular because I find that um, you know the dominant voices within polyfeminism um, lack uh, engagement uh, with structural power relationships, and there's a strong emphasis of a, you know, of a choice discourse. So a lot of polyamory activism debate is remain stuck within a liberal um, framework. So um, turning to these histories, uncovering these archives, um, would um, help to produce a more reflexive discourse um, on, yeah, also geopolitical inequalities um, and, um, yeah. Thank That's you. all I want to say, and I'm sorry for taking you